and welcome back or if you're new here just welcome my name is rusty and this is me channel where i talk about me favorite movies mostly horror and me favorite music mostly metal and welcome to slasher fest this is my first slasher fest for this channel i've been doing these little themes and i find that kind of fun so i've chosen seven of my little slashers for this one of course there will be many more especially since slashers is my favorite genre of horror that's slashers killer kids is number two i don't know why killer kids bother me so bad but they do so anyway what would be your weapon of choice if you were a killer a slasher I was thinking about that question and I was like you know I think I like this I mean come on if you're gonna be killed by a slasher kill me with style okay not a plain old kitchen knife how boring is that be creative so I really like this one however there is an option too and I think I would kind of like it better this is a real one by the way it's not fake I love this knife so I would definitely be killing you with style but I also like creativity so my other favorite weapon and this is kind of what I think I would choose are my hand throwing knives now some might say well how is that slashing well I will tell you how that's slashing because not only are they excellent these are sharp as fuck too not only are they excellent to get somebody at a distance okay but these are formed see they have a handle grip that's for your thumb so not only is it made for throwing but it's got a perfectly grooved thumb rest so could slash up somebody with that right so I'm like yeah be creative you know you're not gonna drop these either because that thumb rest right there really keeps it up not that I'm giving a class on killing people but yes so I think in the end these would be my trademark slash 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 stab both sides razor sharp slash slash you get it in both ends so yes what would your weapon of choice be if you were a slasher you know mine I might have to take a couple out with this though just for stylistic sake and again welcome to slasher fest and we are going to as you saw in the title we are going to start this week off with Blood Rage. Now, this is one of those silly boutique things. But I absolutely love this movie. It comes with the DVD and the Blu-ray. And it comes with the reversible cover. I do kind of like their color cover their new cover a little bit better i would show you these things but then it's always such a bitch to get them back in so yes blood rage
Now, Blood Rage was released in 1987. However, Blood Rage was filmed in 1983, which makes it an early 80s slasher that wasn't released until a late 80s slasher. Now, there is a... I know there's at least one more in this week that has a similar story. So, Blood Rage, like I said, was released in 1997. It stars Louise Lasser, Mark Soper, and Julie Gordon. It was directed by John Grismer and written by Bruce Rubin. Yeah, it really was. And so, let's talk about it. Now, this movie opens in 1974 at a drive-in. A really cool-looking drive-in drive in, in Jacksonville, Florida. This movie was filmed not far. Well, it's a couple of hours that way um, from me. And um, so it was filmed in the swamps of Florida, and it's set in Jacksonville, Florida. So the original title of this movie was Slasher, just plain Slasher. Mm, I don't know. I kind of like Blood Rage better. We'll get into that argument with Butcher Baker. But, um, so, we're at the drive-in, and that was really funny. I mean, this movie is so cheesy, but it's so cheesy in the right way. You know, it's set in 1974, but interestingly enough, the whole thing looks 80s. I mean, I, well, they had some hippies in a van at the drive-in, but... In truth, like in the concession stand, the dudes were so 80s. They had the 80s haircut. They were wearing the 80s clothes. It was like Valley Girl. It was really cool. Um, so that's a little weird, you know, but um, I think it adds to the charm of it. Now, what is interesting is this really cute one. He goes into the bathroom and this guy walks up. And he's wearing a trench coat and stuff like that. And he opens it up. And you know like you see in movies, the guy with the trench coat with all the stolen watches or the drugs or something like that. He opens it up, but it's like condoms. You know, hey man, which one you want? You know, so the guy picks out, I like Trojans. <laughs> it's like, and that was um, Sam Raimi's brother. So little, so young, so it was it was really cute, you know, to see him. Um, it's Ted Raimi, who is the brother of Sam Raimi, is the is the condom dealer with the trench coat. So um, that's a cool little bit of movie cast trivia. Now we meet the mother. And she's there with her date, Maddie. She's there with her date. And they're making out in this uh, station wagon that looks out like the first season of, again, it looks like the, you know, it's 80s. It looks like the one Sue Ellen drove in the first season of Dallas. Why Sue Ellen always drove station wagons, I'll never get out of it. That's just a different story. But, I mean, they're filthy rich. They owned half of Texas, and she went around in station wagons through the whole damn show. It was strange. What kind of very rich lady would drive station wagons? But again, I thought I was going to stop that. Now, um, the kids, she thinks that the kids are asleep. She has a set of twin boys, Todd and Terry, and they're in the back. You know, so the guy wants to make out, and she's like, oh, but the kids, oh, but they're asleep. And so they start making out, and the kids, like, sneak out, and they're, like, walking around in the park or in the, in the drive-in. And they're peeking in windows, and of course they come up on this couple that are, could they really do that? I mean, I understand people make out in drive-ins, but I mean, they stripped completely naked and were in their car. Is it really that private in a drive-in? I've only been a few times, but, um, so they come up on this couple, and you know, and the guy, he like looks up, and he's like, what the fuck are you doing, you perv? Like, get the hell out of here. Well, on the way, he had stopped and picked up this hatchet from the back of a truck. 
And he just starts wailing on him. I mean, he just starts, like, cutting him in the face. Like, he was doing his best Lizzie Borden impersonation. And it was very, it was, it was gory. The practical effects in this movie are great. There, of course, is no CGI in this movie. And they did really, really good. So he, like, you know, hacks up this guy. And his brother, um, Todd, is just standing there behind him like, what the fuck? I mean, he is so shocked that Terry just cut this guy up that, you know, he, he can't speak. He's just, like, traumatized. Now, the girl had jumped out and started screaming and running off. And so, of course, a crowd was coming around. And as soon as they started noticing and the crowd starts coming, um, Terry, he reaches over there and he, he rubs his hand across Todd's face and puts the hatchet in his hand and then just starts going, he did it, he did it, he, he, he cut that guy up and I don't know why. You know, and so the mother, she runs up and, uh, oh my God, we're going to talk about her. Um, so they think it's Todd that did this. Now, we flash 10 years later into the future. Now, Todd has been in a mental institution this whole time, and Terry has just been living his best life after cutting this, you know, cutting that guy up. So, it's Thanksgiving dinner, and uh, Maddie goes to the institute to see Todd, where the doctor has some news. And that is that his memory has started returning. And he has been able to get across to her that it was not him that did that. It was Terry. Now, any killer is going to say that, so I'm not saying that they immediately, you know, but the doctor actually believes him. So she informs the mother, and the mother was just like, like you know, oh, well, no, not my Terry. You know, he, he didn't do that. Now, why she would think her Todd did that, but her Terry didn't. But then again, she's had 10 years of, of, you know, mama's boy, whereas he's been, Todd's been locked up, so she doesn't have any relationship with Todd like she does with Terry. So she lets him know that, you know, I mean, she lets the mom know that that's the new situation that's developing. And they actually, you know, meet, and it's the first time that they've met in a long time. So she actually meets Todd. Um, he freaks out a little bit, you know, and um, she ends up leaving and going back home. So she goes back home um, at this complex in Jacksonville where they're living. And um, she's got, who is it? Uh, they met a new girl that had moved in, a new family had moved in. So there is her and her boyfriend, her fiancé. Um, he is the owner of this complex. So it's them two. It's Terry and Terry's girlfriend. And it's that new girl and that new girl's mother. And they're like actually having Thanksgiving dinner together. So um I just got ahead of my notes, didn't I? So her and her family, right? So they're all sitting around having that. And she gets a phone call in the middle of it. Now, you are starting to notice that this mother is Maddie. This woman, this woman is probably, do you remember, if, if you know the aunt in Sleepaway Camp? She's like that but not in a crazy way, more in a emotional basket case way. And so she had gotten a phone call and she had went into the kitchen where they had were told, where she was told that Todd is missing, that he has left, he has escaped the Institute. So she calls Terry in there and tells Terry about it. Um, now, this is just after she has also at, uh, revealed that her and this guy are going to get married, Mr. King, 
that they are going to get married. They're going to finally be married. Now, Terry don't look too happy about that either. So, she's like, you know, don't tell anyone that Todd's escaped um, or taken off, you know, because we want to have this wonderful Thanksgiving and don't ruin it. So, he says, of course, and then he goes out and he sits down and within 30 seconds he tells them all, my crazy brother Todd has escaped the Institute. And the mother gives him a look like, why would you do that? You know, I mean, she just cannot believe what an asshole. And it would just never occur to her to call him an asshole, but most normal people would. But this mother is anything but normal. So he tells the guests, and then we see Todd walking down the street. And of course, he's coming home. So uh, Dr. Uh, Berman and an orderly, uh, what was his name? But anyway, uh, the orderly, Jackie. I had to think of that Sinead O'Connor song, Jackie, which I love. That's what I associate him with. But um, so her orderly, Jackie. And he shows up. They almost, she almost tranks Terry because they're twins, right? So when she figures out that it's not Todd, um, she shows up, tells the mother that she's sure that he's on his way to this complex and that they should all, you know, split up and go looking at him, uh, looking for him. So um, her, her fiance. Mr. King, he goes to his office, um, which is on the property, and tells her everything will be fine, and he'll go to the office, and, you know, uh, the doctor, she goes and searches the woods, and Jackie, he goes and searches the patios. Um, uh, the, I mean, it's a 10-acre complex, so it's pretty, it's a pretty big. So, we then get to see the first new kill and that is terry shows up they they don't make no secret about who's doing what they did that from the very beginning there is no mystery so terry takes the opportunity to go and hatchet mr king and cuts his hand off great effects great special effects um and we don't even know the extent of that kill until later. But just what you think, you know, just what you saw was gross enough. So he kills him. The next one up is Jackie. And it was really funny because he's bored. He, he sits down on someone's back patio and he's singing the song Maniac from Flashdance. You know, except he changes the word from maniac to lunatic. But he's singing that song. He's a lunatic, lunatic on the floor. So <laughs> um, that was a cool little bit of 80s, flat, you know, 80s pop culture flash there to hear him singing the theme song of, you know, or one of the songs from Flashdance. So Terry comes up to him and he's like, oh my gosh, I thought you were Todd for a second. And they start talking and he tells him, you know, the doctor told me that she doesn't even believe Todd really killed him. You know, and he's like, really, that's cool. And then he runs him through with that machete. Again, really good practical effects. And um, so that was a really good kill. Then we have a really go gross kill because he goes out there into the woods where he kills the doctor. And... I wasn't, I really wasn't when I first sat down to watch this movie. I really wasn't expecting it to be as graphic as it was, which is always something that you should never prejudge because, I mean, I Spit on Your Grave was in the 70s. So why I was surprised about the amount of graphic gore, but he cuts the doctor in half. Like, she's literally laying there, and she's alive for like 20, 20 seconds. 
because he cuts her in half at the waist. So you actually see her laying there and the other half of her. And it was really gross. <laughs> it was a, th that was good. So Todd arrives there at the complex. And when Terry goes back to change his shirt, because uh, he's killed, what, three people now? So this is where we get to see here the famous, his famous line from this movie, which is, it's not cranberry sauce. So, you know, he does that many times during the movie. So it's sort of like the little catchphrase of this movie is that that's not cranberry sauce, Terry, is what he tells himself. And it's also what he tells other people later. So, um, Terry ends up going to that new girl's apartment. And she wants to make out, but he doesn't. Um, Karen ends up coming to see Terry at his apartment. Karen is Terry's boyfriend. I mean, yeah. So, when she gets there, nobody answers the door. And she walks around to the back and runs into Todd, whom she thinks is Terry. So she talks to him for a minute, and you kind of wonder what's going to happen here. But he, he fesses right up. And he says, I'm not Terry, I'm Todd. And she's like, the, from the hospital hatchet? Ooh, okay. So that was a nice little tension scene. She gets away from him because he's not, he doesn't try to hurt her or nothing. She's just, as you would imagine, freaked the fuck out. <laughs> so um, she goes and she finds a couple of um, their friends and tells them about it after he tells her, you know, that he's not Terry. So she runs out there and finds Artie and, and uh, Bud. Is his name Bud? His name isn't Bud. Oh, I think I meant she tells Artie and his buddy okay, that Todd is here. So, um... Terry and Andy leave, meet Karen and Artie and Greg. That's the that's the buddy. That's his friend. So they all start like looking around for him, you know. Um Todd tells or, or Todd goes out and finds he's creeping around, so he finds the doctor's body out there in the woods. And he gets the gun out of her purse that she had. And um he even starts crying about it. I think he liked her. I mean, well, of course, you know, she believed him and had been helping him. So, um, so he gets her gun. Now, Andy and Karen and Greg and Artie, they go back to the apartment, you know, uh, to party. And, uh, Terry shows up and previously that new girl had been babysitting for this couple and Terry makes use of them. He kills the guy, kills that that woman very ugly. The guy was like, they, he decapitates him and leaves his head hanging at the door. So when she comes out looking for him and opens the front door, his head is hanging there like, you know, like those masks you see right there. <laughs> so that was a fucked up scene. And, um... So, we're, of course, seeing the mother all through this. And um, we see Todd going back into the house. The mother is, like, popping pills left and right, drunk off her ass, which, you know, I can understand with all of this that's going on. So, Todd's, like, looking through his old room. He's looking through Terry's room. Um... And you can imagine how he's feeling, having been blamed for all of this, and also very concerned because this killer, his own brother, is loose. So we have a little scene. I put, I wrote, um, Mom is a loon. She is. You have to see this movie. That woman is, I, you, I can't even describe 
what kind of loon this woman is. But she is like an emotional basket case. Just, and, and she plays this part, which I found kind of interesting. She plays this part like Betty Davis in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. I mean, it's that overly, over the top. Um, in a really good way. It's uh, Yeah, hush, hush, sweet Charlotte. Betty Davis wasn't quite as over the top as she was in Baby Jane. But, yeah, she plays it like that. I'm talking just, like, really dramatic, overly dramatic. And um, you will definitely, uh, the mom, you will definitely have something to say about it. So, Terry ends up, like, scaring Art and Car- Artie and Karen. Um, when he goes, you know, Art goes looking for her, um, for the other two. Where's it at? Andy and Greg. Andy had, and Greg had went off. And so, that's when he's looking for them leaving Karen alone, and then Terry shows up. So, Terry finds out that they're all gone, and she go, he goes, well, I'm going to go look for them. You, you just wait and stay here. Now, he manages to find Artie, and Artie is out looking for, you know, Andy and, you know, Andy and that other girl. And... He ends up taking him out into the woods where Artie finds this, like, collection of weaponry, like the machete and stuff like that. And supposedly they're out there looking for Todd. Now, Todd is actually standing right over there in the woods and then watches Terry, like, he kills Artie with, like, one of those big barbecue forks. So that was fucked up. Now, um... After Terry has killed Artie, uh, Karen finds Terry, who, out there in the woods, who is, like, covered in blood, because he just killed Artie. And she's like, oh my god, what happened to you? And he tried to fake it for just a minute. But then he didn't even bother. You know, because then, all of a sudden, she's like, what is that behind your back? And he holds up this big machete, and she's like, oh, this is what Todd was using. And all he did was give her, like, she gave him, like, a weird look, questioning look, and he just, like, gave up. And instead, he raised it up and started saying, I love you, Karen, and he starts trying to kill her. So, she now knows that Todd is not the one who is doing this, that it's Terry that's doing it. So, the big chase begins through the woods. Um, and we have the typical slasher chase scene. He, she ends up going to that couple that he had killed. And he had actually not killed the woman yet. She was just tied up in the bedroom. So Karen, you know, gets into that apartment because she's, of course, like banging on everybody's door trying to get help. And she walks into the bedroom and watches as he pulls the machete out of that woman's chest right in front of her. So she's kind of screwed. She tries to get out. He, she ends up like trying to make a phone call. She tries to call 911. And she gets behind this cabinet, but he finds her, this dresser drawer. And she's standing right in front of him, and you just know this is going to be it for her, right? But then she balls him really good and I don't mean in the good way she balls him really good and that's how she manages to grab the baby remember that couple had a baby it's been sitting there in the in the pram the whole time <laughs> so she grabs that baby and takes off running so the the chase continues now um the other two what in the hell were their names Uh, Andy and Greg. So Andy and Greg had went off to play midnight tennis and then there were some little scenes of tension and and stuff that went on there and they end up in the pool room. So this is where Karen ends up 
going to the pool house. Now, before she can get there, though, Terry had done his business there already. We get this really cool scene where they were making out on the diving board, and Terry slashes them up really good. And um, he has now put their body in the sauna, like that 247 degrees Fahrenheit movie, you know, the sauna room. And um, so that's where their bodies are. So Karen manages to get there to the pool during this chase. Now she then hides the baby in like a cabinet under the sink. You know, it's like, I hope there's no rats in there, but it's part of the movie. So she hides the baby in there and uh, she then finds the bodies of the other two in the sauna. Terry is still after her. She manages to duck, dive, weave, and dodge. And she ends up, like, even hiding in um, a bathroom stall. And Terry actually comes into the stall next to her and takes a leak while she's sitting there. She thinks he's gone. And then we have the big, you know, where he jumps out at her. She thinks he's gone, but he catches her. So... This ends up bleeding out into the actual pool area. Now, that's where Todd comes in. Todd comes in. Of course, I'm leaving a lot of stuff out. You, you need to watch it. But so Todd comes in and um, him and Terry are finally at a face off. Now, Karen, of course, she runs right up to Todd and gets behind him like, you know, you're the you're the he's the crazy one. So. Um, they end up getting in this knockdown, drag out fight, and uh, about that time, the mother shows up. She has completely lost her mind now, because we had just seen a scene where she had went looking for her boyfriend with all this trauma, her fiance. She went to his office, went into the room, and Terry had propped him up, so he's got no hand. But he like stuck his hand up on him. So he had propped him up at the desk. And the mom, she can only see him from behind. So she comes in like, I've been trying to call you. Where have you been? What are you doing? And she walks up to him and I tell you. The coincidence was not funny. Because by this time of the movie, I had went and cooked a hot dog. And a few steak fries. So I was sitting here eating a hot dog. And I was halfway through that bitch. When this scene occurred. So the mother walks up to behind him. You know, and I'm sitting there with half a hot dog in my mouth. You know, and I'm like. I thought we had seen all that had happened to him, right? So she starts like getting really freaky. Like. Why isn't he moving? Why isn't he asking me? And she kind of leans up there to him and she touches him on the shoulder. Now, when this happens, he fall. you know, his, his nub comes out from his chin and he falls on the desk. How inappropriate. Because when he fell on that desk, his head split in half. Not this way. Not this way, but this way so when he fell directly in front of the camera his head like parted and i've got half a hot dog in my mouth i did not see that coming neither did the hot dog because i was just like oh i think that i think that has disturbed me Needless to say, I put the hot dog down, <laughs> and I and I had to think for a second. You know, I was like, "Am I all right? I mean, am I fisting to throw up? Hold on. No, I don't feel it. I I think I'm okay. I just really didn't see that coming. I do feel this little nauseous feeling." But I'll be all right. 
So that thing caught me off guard. That that was a really good effect, though, because when his head separated like that, I was just like, no fucking way. That was n that was very rude of you. I mean, it was cool, but you really, I mean, you know, come on. People could be eating while they're watching this movie. I guess directors don't think that. Of course, then they would just say, why are you eating during a horror movie, especially a slasher? Well, I don't expect, I didn't expect his hat, head to, like, loaf over you know, and like a, a bread loaf. I mean, it was just, dis I was, that was rough. You don't want ketchup-covered hot dog in your mouth when you see someone's brains. I'm just letting you know. But, so, the mom comes into the pool room now. And Terry's on one side of the pool. Todd's on the other. We can tell by their shirts who is who. And she starts screaming, you know, at the one closest to her. And, you know, Karen has to say, no, 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 not him. It's him. He's the one. The mom thinking Todd. So she fucking shoots him dead. So the mom is the one who ends up killing Terry. Then, of course, she's like, Oh, it's okay now. I'm so sorry. Everything's fine. But she's upset. My poor baby. But, you know, Terry, you're all right now. You know, uh, I, I don't need a boyfriend. And I, I, we just need to be happy together. And then that's when Todd is like, I'm not Terry. I'm Todd. Terry was the psycho the whole time, right? And Karen had just tried to tell the dumb bitch that too. Because she has completely lost it. But then again. If your fiancé's head just splits in half in front of you, I'm sure that you're going to have a little bit of trauma. Probably not, only not going to be, you're probably not going to be too rational at the moment. But still, Karen had tried to tell her that that was Terry that she shot. Terry was the psycho the whole time. Mom can't handle it. So she starts saying, you know, she starts repeating over and over, I'm tired, I'm tired, I'm tired. And then she picks up the gun and blows her own brains out. She's just like, bam. Sunroof in the head. You know what I mean? So, Todd and Karen, like, you know, embrace, not in a, in a rational way, but holy fuck, what did we just live through kind of way. And you hear the cops coming. And the movie ends. And you're like, well, you know, he could pretend to be Terry. Because Terry was never accused of anything. So what is he going to do? You know, and the reason I say that is because there was a scene in the mom's bedroom when she was like passed out on drugs, pills and, and booze. Where she kind of woke up and Todd was in there with her. And, you know, and she woke up and she's like, cause she kept calling him Terry, you know, it's like, oh, my baby Terry, you know, I, I wish they would find your brother. And he, he was like, he let her believe he was Terry. And, you know, so you kind of think that is an option. I don't know what I would do. Because, you know, Todd has all this baggage. Right? <laughs> Todd has all this baggage. Whereas now that Terry's dead, he could just say he's Terry, who never had any baggage. Because everybody... Well, wait a second. We're forgetting about Karen, aren't we? Karen knows he's Todd. Okay. See, even on camera, I'm okay with... with, with Letting you see me go through these little thought processes and even correcting myself. I forgot about Karen. He could kill her. But he's not a bad guy. So he's going to have to, well, I guess he's going to have to face the shit. Unless Karen agreed to hide his identity. You know, he's going to have to. I'm Todd, I did escape, but it was never me, it was me brother. See, that's a lot more complicated than just saying you're Terry. Unfortunately, we have the Karen problem. 
I don't think I would kill her over it, though. Because she, you know, she can testify in his defense, right? Yeah, Artie's dead. Greg and Andy are dead. Yeah, there's nobody else to testify for him. But Karen can testify that it was Terry. So maybe he can get away with it all. You know, I don't mean get away with it. He didn't do anything. But I mean, maybe he could get away without a problem by sort of getting his name back, getting his reputation back. I was never that guy. I did not kill that man at the drive-in. You know, I, I did not do any of this. Karen is my witness, so I don't know. In America, judges, you know, juries, they can do some stupid shit, so I don't know. But still, I think that's what he's going to have to do. Anyway, I enjoy these little philosophical conversations and trying to figure out. That's why I love these movies, yes? What are your thoughts? <laughs> so, yeah. So what does it say? Oh, she shoots herself. Oh, I wrote best thing for her, really. I know, I felt like Hannibal Lecter when I said that. You remember, like, in Silence of the Lambs, when when he told Jodie Foster about, you know, the uh, person that had been his patient, and she's like, what did he do to your patient, doctor? And he's like, you know, oh, nothing. He just, you know, I didn't do anything to him. I found him that way. And I just, you know, put him away. But it was the best thing for him, really. You know, and that's kind of the way I felt about the mom. Because <laughs> it's like, yeah, there comes a pat. There, I think there comes a point of damage that is just not recoverable from. So, yeah, she shoots herself. Best thing for her, really, is what I wrote. But, yeah. So, I absolutely love this movie. It is, it's so much cheese. Um, but it's really good cheese. And, uh, yes. So this is 1987's Blood Rage. Day one. This is the Arrow release of the movie. Great special features. Great scan. Looks really good. They did keep the original title. So like when the, when the movie starts, um, it does not say Blood Rage. It says Slasher. So um, they kept the original title uh, for the opening credits. And um, yeah, that is Blood Rage. Day one, Slasher Fest. Please come back and join me for another. Let me know. Your weapon of choice if you were a slasher. And... uh I'll talk to you in the next one. Thank you very much for dropping by. Uh, love you, miss you. Bye. And always remember, never forget, you're a very, very special person. Don't let anyone tell you anything different. And, uh, yeah, I'll see you in day two. Um, please support physical media. Please support indie horror. And, uh, yes, love you, miss you. Bye. Blood Rage, a.k.a. Slasher. And I will see you in day number two. Bye-bye.